Well, welcome everybody to a Keon webinar series. This is the fourth webinar that Keon is putting online for, uh, for our users, our customers to continue with their education, even though in these times there's restrictions on travel and contact. Um, this is a webinar about Paul. We have two presenters today for you. We have Dr. Aldo Vetsoni, who has done, uh, well, probably about 100 Paul cases. And hopefully Dr. Brian Saunders will be able to join us as well. Uh, the Paul system was started in uh, 2011 as a clinical product. There have been over 5,000 procedures performed till now. There's been some, I guess, some reluctance of people to use Paul based on a publication that has come out that was on some ex vivo testing. This testing was not correctly performed. And the presentation of Dr. Brian Saunders shows um, a different ex vivo testing that does show Paul does what we expect it to do. Um, I'm the CTO of Keon. I've been working with Dr. Tepic since the late eight, 1980s in DeVos, so over 30 years now. And I am a, my role as the CTO at Keon is a 50% position where 50% of my time is spent with Scion Orthopedics, a human orthopedic company set up to bring some of the technologies we develop in Keon to the human market. And the other 50% is here as the CTO for Keon. Uh, the first presentation today will be by Dr. Vizzoni. And um, I would love. Uh, we will hold the question and answer till after both presentations are made. At this time, I'll turn the turn the webinar over to, to Aldo. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm very pleased to be here to bring you my experience on poll. And uh, the reason why I'm performing it uh, regularly and more frequently since uh, over 10 years. My conflict of interest is um, that because I am paid teacher in the Kai and Paul courses, but I don't have any other financial relationship with Kion. So why my choice for, is for Paul when uh, I have to deal with a chronic elbow dysplasia? Because elbow replacement is not still yet widely used, and uh, more, more important, in case of failure, it could end up in elbow arthrodesis or limb amputation, and when you speak with the owner about those uh, even not frequent complications, they are not happy to go in that direction. So hopefully in the future, more reliable elbow replacement will be available. So it could be a different story. About other surgical procedures that are all palliative, so sliding humeral osteotomy or Q are all palliative while Paul is a palliative too, but is less invasive and with a less and more easily affordable risk of complication. The case selection we are doing is an adult dox, so uh, from one year to nine years, even we prefer to stay younger. So when we go at that age and nine year, usually the outcome is not so, and, and so beautiful like in younger dogs. Those dogs have a lameness, so persistent lameness that is unresponsive to conservative or simple arthroscopic treatment, and they have osteoarthritis caused by medial coronary process disease and or OCD in combination. And the end result of that disease is a medial compartment disease. We offer a palliative treatment with expected variable improvement, or in the worst scenario, no improvement, and that improvement is age and osteoarthritis dependent, osteoarthritis degree dependent, but we didn't never see, never saw worsening. Of course, we have a better result in young adult and middle-aged dog, and not so enthusiastic in older dogs. A typical example is a young dog like this, a golden retriever, to have months of age with a medial coronary process disease and medial compartment outer bridge grade three disease. You see chondromalacia and some erosion. Or another typical case is um, 
German Shepherd, 1.5 year old, with an outer bridge of four degree exposure of the subchondral bone. And uh, you see that the uh, erosion, uh, you don't see just the fragmented coronoid process, but also a huge erosion of all the media compartment. In other dogs like this, Rottweiler, four years old, a big dog, 45 kilogram, with a uh, um, media coronary process disease, and again, a, a complete uh, outer bridge of four degree of a uh, media compartment disease with a full erosion exposure of the subchondral bone. When we have uh, uh, different cases like this, uh, in older dogs uh, up to nine years of age, uh, this is an 8.5 years old Bernese mountain dog, and you see huge erosion on the media compartment. In those cases, the prognosis is more reserved. And in case uh, where we have uh, um, another typical example, just to say that we absolutely need to do an uh, arthroscopic uh, evaluation of the joint, because uh, not only to see that we have a medial compartment disease, but also to have a look at the lateral compartment with a steel cartilage. That is mandatory. Otherwise, our procedure will not be effective. And so here, yeah, another example of a Labrador, five years old. You see a very huge bed uh, a radiographic appearance of the elbow, but the lateral side of the joint is safe, so we have a good cartilage. So those cases are a good indication for pull. If we see that we have the fragmented coronary process, but we don't see any medial compartment disease, we just do a telescopic treatment, so there is no reason for doing pull in those cases. And if we see a radial head erosion in combination with the medial compartment disease, that is a, a reserve prognosis. So uh, we can cho choose uh, not doing any treatment or just doing the poll, but with the expected not so good result. And when you see an st end stage medial compartment disease, like in this Labrador, uh, the prognosis, of course, is much more reserved. We can even do the procedure, but we cannot expect a good result in such a condition because of so severe uh, degeneration of the joint. But Paul is absolutely contraindicated when we see a lateral compartment involvement. And this is a, was a young dog, a border collie, who received a previous joint infiltration. And so joint infiltration is in, could lead to um, infection and then a full joint involvement, and in such cases, there is no, um, no advantage of doing the pull procedure. Also, we exclude dogs that had uh, um, the joint disease caused by UOP, a United Anconair process, with a still incongruity of short ulna and long, uh, long radius, so that uh, it means that we have a radial head degeneration and we cannot provide pull in such advanced cases of UOP. Our planning is uh, including um, AP view, uh, perfect AP view to measure the mechanical elbow medial angle, and uh, just to decide if we want to go with a two millimeter or three millimeter step pull. And when the, uh, that angle is uh, under 82, a three millimeter step, it will be indicated. And uh, when it's over 82 degrees, uh, a two millimeter step, which is also my first choice when we do very old dog because they have a so huge um, osteoarthritis and also most of the time they have a synostosis between radius and ulna and doing a three millimeter step it will cause too much stress on the on the ulna. My experience is based on 133 elbows are treated with pole in 123 dogs, 10 at bilateral from February 2010 to June 2020. So it's a 10-year experience. And I've been able to get a good follow-up because 95% of the dog, we have at least two months of follow-up. And in 74%, we have six months of follow-up, so 99 cases. And in half of my cases, 68 cases, we have at least one year or more, up to five-year follow-up. So we uh, look at the uh, at the outcome. So the expected outcome when we speak the owner is not a miracles intervention. So that uh, it should be clear 
that this is a palliative treatment because the dogs that will continue to have their osteoarthritis and owners should be aware that dog will maintain the elbow condition caused by elbow dysplasia. And so relapses of lameness due to environmental factors like excessive exercise or meteorological variation are normal and they should be already aware of that possibility. But what we want to achieve is expected reduction of joint pain, eliminating friction in the medial compartment, and that will cause a reduction of lameness. So less need of NSAID or no need at all. In some many cases, they never use again NSAID, and dogs appear more active and more willing to go out and make their exercise. The assessment of the outcome we do is assessment of the lameness. And then we do a load of questionnaire, which is filled by the owners before and every time they come for the follow-ups after a minimum of six months. And then we, um, in many cases, we are doing gait analysis with a, um, a gait for dogs uh, met. And we do that at least uh, six months after our uh, procedure. Osteoarthritis scoring before and after at the follow-ups with one year or more. And then we report complication. And if possible, we do a second look at Toscopy and then we show you a few cases. About complication, we had the 10 major complications requiring a revision, so 7.5%. Two were plate breakage, but there were a prototype plates so in the early 2010, 2011. And then we never saw again in, uh, in the final uh, pole plate. We had to remove eight plates because of loosening infection or stress shielding, which we use our cases, and three minor complications, but not requiring a revision, like a screw um, is isolated screw breakage or um, isolated screw loosening. And uh, one case of asymptomatic stable non union we have been able to follow for many years and still stable. We never saw catastrophic complications require more um, invasive surgery. About a plate breakage, this is an example of a prototype. We just removed the broken plate, put a new one, and that the problem was solved. So easy handle. And uh, infection, we wait for a bone healing, and then we remove the plate. Or stretch shielding, that could occur at the beginning when all the sizes of pore were not available. So we use a big plate in a smaller dog and causing stretch shielding. And then we just removing the plate, we solve the problem. So you can see that in those cases, complications were quite easily managed. And then uh, about uh, the um, other minor complication like isolated screw breakage, as you can see here or here, not requiring revision. And this is the only case of non-union but asymptomatic and is still like that after six or seven years. The clinical assessment of lameness was uh, performed in, uh, according to the classification of four degrees. So the uh, grade one is an infrequent and mild lameness. Grade two is a frequent but mild. Grade three is always and mild to moderate. And grade four, always and severe. So looking at that uh, chart, uh, that is the uh, um, assessment of lameness six months, a uh, uh, minimum six months after surgery. And in the blue line, you see the, the lameness before. So most of our cases at a grade two and uh, some of them are grade three. But after surgery, you see that most of them, they are in the group of zero grade one. So that is uh, the majority of our cases, 30% no lameness and 59 grade one. So altogether, they account for almost 90% of our cases. And if we look at the longer term follow-up, one year or more after surgery, again, you see that before surgery, most of them, they had a grade two mild persistent lameness, while after surgery, we have a, about half of the dog that don't claim lameness, and 38, they claim a grade one occasional lameness. So again, the vast majority of dogs were in the group of no lameness or only mild and occasional lameness. About the load, the Liverpool osteoarthritis dog questionnaire that was validated against a force plate, 
Uh, of course, there is some influence by different owner perspective, but it's interesting to see how it developed during the uh, follow-up. These are, for example, 28 dogs before and 19 of them we have been able to collect uh, after one year. And you see that uh, before surgery, the blue line, most of them, they have a high number or in the question, so it means uh, quite a lot of uh, impairment of function and uh, significant pain in the joint. While after one year, you see in the green line, we have a much less number, so they have a, a much better activity they can afford. So we are doing also a pressure centric walkway with a gate for, for dogs, which is quite interesting investigation. And uh, you can see here that in, uh, in those 29 dogs uh, before and in 10 of them, we've been able to measure after one year. And you see that before surgery, most of them, they very low uh, percentage of loading on each uh, in, on their front limb, while after one year, they go to uh, almost 50%, uh, they have 100% of loading in the affected limb and the other they have between uh, 80 to 100, so quite a good improvement also in, uh, in this uh, uh, very um, objective way to evaluate it. About uh, radiographic assessment of bone union, most of them they heal in three months, but uh, since we were using pull 2 which is much stronger, provide a much stronger fixation, much stable fixation, we are seeing many dogs at two months as a complete healing. In the past, uh, we saw that uh, older dogs, uh, they took more time to heal, and we have one case on an union, as I showed you before, but uh, with the majority of the cases, uh, in three months, uh, they heal it. And uh, this is an example with a pull tool that even was an eight years old golden retriever. You see that at two months, uh, we have a primary bone healing without any callus formation, which means a very stable fixation. About uh, the progression of osteoarthritis that has been evaluated uh, uh, after a minimum of one year after surgery, and we always saw uh, that was a minimal to moderate further osteoarthritis progression. In some cases, it was almost undetectable. You see here a golden retriever, three years old when it was operated, and uh, you see two years follow up, uh, and the, uh, the condition of the joint is almost the same in the both views, a mediolateral and sagittal view. This is another example of a German Shepherd, one year and a half when it was operated. And you see that the two years follow up, you have very mild progression of osteoarthritis and in both views, a two years follow up. This is a Rottweiler, he was two years old when he got uh, the treatment. And you see that three years follow up you don't see any progression of osteoarthritis. So the condition is like freezing, not progressing. And that for us is very important. And that I think is due to uh, the uh, stopping of the rubbing on the media compartment uh, that was previously collapsed. Another example with a longer term uh, um, follow-up of four years. It was four years when it was operated. This is four years later. And again, you don't see any uh, significant progression of osteoarthritis. While if you take other examples of dogs with the same condition that, that did not, had not been treated for different reason, but has been followed in the years. So you see this German Shepherd, five years old. When it was rechecked two years later, you see quite a severe progression of osteoarthritis in that joint. And again, in, in this mongrel, 22 kilogram T are sold, and we have a four year follow up with a huge progression of osteoarthritis, which is the rule without any treatment for those conditions. Uh, we have been able to do a few cases of second look at oscopy, and this dog has a grade four outer bridge calcification that was a, a pre op one year later. And you see, we don't see so much, uh, any progression of osteoarthritis. But what we saw in that dog was a fiber cartilage formation where previously we saw a complete exposure of the subchondral bone. Very interesting is uh, the study we are conducting now on, on suggestion by Ingofile, who got the best result adding pole and stem cell. This is a case of him. 
I mean, Labro nine months old, so you see that it's possible to do even in uh, younger than one year. So uh, many surgeons do at nine to 10 or uh, 11 months of age. We prefer in those cases to do the bioblique uh, proximal dynamic osteotomy in combination with uh, joint treatment, but it's possible to provide also pole in those young dogs. And this dog was a Labrador with a quite severe OCD and uh, fragmentation of coronoid. And you see that uh, after three months, uh, after pole and the stem cell, you have a good uh, um, formation of a fibrocartilage covering the uh, exposure, exposed bone. So probably the future for those uh, severe cases and to speed up also the recovery would be to combine stem cells to the pole. So in conclusion, of, of this is my short presentation, is that pole is a pilot treatment because already uh, osteotitis is already established and though you cannot cancel, you can stop it, but you cannot remove it. And uh, we can say that we have a very consistent result after 10 years of clinic experience. And uh, we saw a consistent clinical improvement after four, six months, and not before, it depends by the speed of a bone union of the osteotomy, because until you don't get a complete osteotomy, the dog can feel pain in the callus formation of the osteotomy. So for that reason, we want to evaluate our improvement at least after four, six months after surgery. The stability, the functional stability in long term, we didn't see a relapse or worsening after years, so the condition remains stable. We were already prepared to see some worsening and eventually to go in the direction of elbow replacement. But up to now, in all our cases, we are never being requested to go further with other treatment. Client satisfaction is good, provided they understand and they understood when they speak with them that this is a palliative treatment, so it's not a miracle medicine. The risk of complication is very limited, and so even the, the few cases we had, the removal of the plate was the only procedure we did. And eventually, if in future partial elbow replacement or total elbow replacement will be developed, cannot be prevented, can be done even later, but at the moment has not been requested. So it's the same concept of the corrective osteotomy for knee problem in people. So thank you for uh, uh, listening to me, and I will be pleased uh, to reply you to your question if uh, you will have. Thank you. Great. So, Aldo, we have a, a little bit of a difficulty with this webinar in that the second speaker apparently may be held up in surgery, and we do not have the second presentation at this time. But would you have on hand um, a presentation where you could go over the procedure a bit in like about 15 minutes. Would you have that available? Mm. Okay, um, Steve, I can go with uh, uh, what is new with the poll two uh, about the surgical procedure. Could be okay? Yes, that, that would be great. That'd be a good uh, filler. Okay. Thank you, Aldo. Okay, so these are. Uh, What's new with Pol2? Pol2 has um, a different design and uh, more solid fixation. We have a larger screws, uh, 4.5 millimeter, and the Pol10 and Pol11. Of course, we have a different uh, uh, size uh, according to the um, according to the dimension of the dog. This is an example I just showed you before. And uh, we have uh, all the implants, uh, uh, all the sizes have a two or three millimeter step, as I told you. And the availability of the implant size is uh, pole, um, of for pole two is a size eight, size nine, size 10, and size 11. So we, we thought that we can treat almost our patient with elbow dysplasia. So we can go from big dogs over 45 kilograms with a pole um, size 11. And dogs, uh, the majority of our patients, like Labrador, Golden Retriever, and German Shepherd, they go in this category of from 25 to 45 kilograms, and they deserve the size 10. And these smaller dog, like Border Collies, uh, Australian Shepherd, they would require a size 9, or even is, if it's smaller, a size 8. So you see that we can treat most of our patients. 
We have a different uh, instrumentation. So uh, for the pole size 10 and 11, we use the 4.5 conical locking screws uh, with a Torx 15 uh, screwdriver. So very strong uh, uh, tightening of those screws. And uh, we can use uh, as a temporary screw the 2.7, even nowadays in, are no more uh, frequently used except for distant hole. And uh, for size eight and nine, the, the screws, uh, the conical locking screws are 3.5 self-taping and 2.4 the cortical screw self-taping and Tox 10 for the screwdriver. So very important to have uh, the proper equipment, which is quite simple. So we need just a drill guide, a stopper, so we uh, don't invade uh, the soft tissue when we drill in the hard bone of the una. And that is uh, the reason why we use the drill stoppers. And the same for the small size, um, eight and, and nine. So we have just a smaller drill a smaller um, and drill sleeve, uh, and uh, uh, of course we need a diaper gauge. All the instrument can be stored in a very simple pouches uh, like those, uh, and so they can be sterilized, and so the equipment is uh, quite cheap, it's not so expensive. We need extra instrumentation, like a fine and sharp oscillating saw blade because of the hard bone of the ulna. It's very important to have those uh, pretty new, some with a new, with a good teeth. We need a periodic elevator, jet retractors, and a point and a non-pointed self-holding bone forceps that you will see during the procedure. The planning is very important to be done in our um, X-rays, so we want to be to know exactly where to do our osteotomy, which is about three to four centimeters from the radial head. So we can uh, look at the radial head in surgery, just palpating from lateral, or just reporting the distance from the tip of the olecran to the level where we want to have the osteotomy. And remember that the tip of the plate should be just below the radial head to have the proper position of the plate into, into the bone. And so that is uh, the location of our osteotomy. So that is very important to align properly because if you don't do that, uh, you will not achieve the right amount of uh, medialization of the, uh, of the proximal segment because of the step or in the plate. So if you put the plate too high compared to the osteotomy, so that is not, uh, it will cause less advancement. While if you put the, that, um, the osteotomy more distal, to the expected position in between these two holes, you will improve, you will increase the correction, which could be too much. So it's very important to proper position the plate and the osteotomy. Also, the plate should be kept in the sagittal plane and not in the oblique plane. So that is a mistake, and you, I will show you how to do that in surgery. So here you see that the plate is positioned against the bone after the osteotomy, and uh, you can check the alignment just looking at the motion of the elbow joint and the carpal joint, so you find the sagittal plane, and the plate should be exactly parallel to that plane. And you can adjust with these uh, uh, non-pointed uh, bone-holding forceps. Uh, you can embrace uh, the ulna on the other side, uh, under the muscles, keep the plate against the bone, Remember that the wound here is a little bit curved, so it can slip cranial, uh, um, caudal on cranial, and you have to match to find the right position to be exactly in the sagittal plane. <clears throat> then we want to drill the distal hole, and the distal hole we want to center the plate exactly in the middle of the wound, because if you are not in the middle, like here, the wound will. Uh, mm, will touch the radius during pronation and supination, causing pain, or if it is too caudal, it could not catch properly the ulna. Here again, another mistake, and here even is uh, in the cortical space, so that could create a fracture uh, for the stress riser there uh, bypassing the cortex. So very important to center position six, and the mod distal hole, to center the ulna exactly. 
Again, uh, avoid uh, um, um, soft tissue damage with the drill stoppers, I told you. And very important also to drill with a high speed and low pressure, so you can avoid uh, bone fissure, as you can see in this case, because of too much effort to uh, doing the, the drilling of the bone. Also, another important point is to keep, as soon as you uh, fix the distal hole, to keep that plate exactly parallel to the distal segment of the ulna, the caudal margin of the ulna. And in that way, you can achieve a proper position of the proximal part. Here you can see that uh, the ulna is uh, well parallel to the caudal side of the distal ulna, and it will go exactly in the middle of the proximal ulna. If you are not so parallel, you will catch the, uh, the ulna more caudally, and the thickness of the ulna will be less thick, and so the holding of the plate here could be more, more weak. Another important point is that the, the, the skew should go out of the transcortex for the full thread, not just the tip, because the tip, uh, because it's a cutting uh, screw, uh, is a partial thread. And we want to have a full thread into the um, transcortex, and so it will increase the holding. If not, it will go out, as you can see here. So those are not a good case. Also, we need to elevate uh, a little bit, so I would say one to two millimeter, no more, depending by the size of the dog, uh, to elevate the tip of the coronoid area from the from the media humerus, and so you do that before fixing with um, after fixation of this segment before providing fixation of the proximal segment. So in those cases, we go with the position one, and then before fixing in position two, three, we elevate that. So now is the fixation is completed, so we have a small step. We want to have a small gap, but we don't need to force uh, to compress uh, because we could change the orientation of the una, and uh, uh, it's a normal to have a, a one to two millimeter gap in the target. And uh, we can uh, fill the gap uh, with a synthetic bone or collagen bone or graft or nothing if we don't have a gap. And then um, uh, the final procedure is a, a very, um, a very proper closure of the antebrachial fascia. And for that uh, reason, we want to avoid uh, any edema formation. And uh, we do a double row continuous suture, as you can see, uh, with absorbable suture. And then we do the closure of the skin. Better to use a nylon uh, uh, skin uh, uh, suture and not. Uh, um, stainless steel staples because they are more irritant and the dog could be encouraged to lick the valve. Also, we do the subcutaneous suture with a Vicry Plus antibacterial coated because it's more safe when we go exactly under the, the skin. We prefer to do a soft bandage, a soft padded bandage to avoid uh, seroma formation, but only for three to four days. And then we check the alignment of our job so we can improve if we did a mistake. And we want to look the alignment. So the plate should be on the sagittal plane. The screw should be parallel, so it means that they are well locked. The distal ulna should be centered exactly in the ulna. Right level, right level of the osteotomy, so the proximal part of the plate should be exactly a little bit underneath the radial head and a little bit of step in the proximal to distal segment. So when we see all those points, we can say that we did a good job or not. And uh, that is what we want to check uh, after surgery, and we can improve for the next uh, case. Okay, uh, uh, Steve, very short, but uh, I don't know how much time I have, so. It was great, Aldo, thank you for great, stepping Aldo, in and adding that, that material. Um, Otto has been collecting questions, and he may have some himself that will bring up a, a discussion session for us now. Um, Otto, just a few questions. Um, here's the first question. Uh, 
is there any data or do you have any data on comparing the bioblique osteotomy and the Paul? So we are collecting data because we have um, quite a bunch. I have about 400, uh, more than 400 cases with a bioblique uh, osteotomy and uh, we're still in, in process to evaluate them. Uh, I just did a paper for veterinary clinics of North America where we mentioned our preliminary results. And uh, I must say that uh, are quite similar to Paul uh, in terms of uh, uh, arresting the evolution of osteoarthritis, but it's very much dependent on, on the, pre, on the preoperative condition. So the worst, the better results are when we do the procedure in very young dogs. It means uh, uh, six, seven months of age uh, with only medial, medial coronoid disease and not OCD. If we have a combination of medial coronoid disease and OCD, the results of uh, bioblique unosteotomy and uh, joint treatment are not so uh, so beautiful like uh, uh, when we have only media components. Okay, and a um, a second question that came up is. Do you perform a one-stage bilateral PAL procedure? And if not, what would be the time between the procedures? Yes, John D is told that uh, the only bilateral uh, simultaneous procedure is a castration. So I am aware of that. I don't do, never do um, bilateral procedure. The only exception is a DPO. In very young dogs, uh, five, six months of age, uh, we can we need to do DPO bilateral. But in heavy dogs, uh, even DPO is a stage a few weeks apart. So in case of Paul, we prefer to stage uh, quite longer. We want to see the result uh, with the first elbow. So we wait at least six months uh, to one year. And then when the owner realizes that the dog now is limping on the other elbow, and then we go for uh, uh, the other procedure. And the same for uh, bioblique uh, uh, unosteotomy, we stage always uh, at least uh, three weeks apart. We saw very severe complication of doing the procedure bilateral with a complete uh, uh, luxation of the radial head, so very bad disaster that fortunately we stay away uh, just staging the procedure a few weeks apart. Um, another uh, follow-up question, there was a few questions on this, but do you have a focused physical rehabilitation program for the cases in which you perform a PAL procedure? Uh, so I believe that the best physiotherapy is a leash working, that's good for the owner and good for the dog, and, uh, and very inexpensive. So that is what I do. I never um, had the, uh, the need to do real physiotherapy and rehabilitation. Uh, so we tell the owner how to do that. So they do gradually. Even in the first month after surgery, even the dog is limping, we uh, suggest uh, to walk every day, at least 15 minutes to two or three times a day, because the, the, the loading, even partial loading, because the dog is lame, it will enhance uh, bone healing of the osteotomy. And then after they come for the, and the second, the first and the second follow-up, we want to be sure they don't use the dog for very active activity like uh, uh, hunting or sport activity because those dogs are not good for that. So we are also to remember that those dogs, those dogs are affected by elbow dysplasia and we are not canceling the elbow dysplasia. They are still affected by elbow dysplasia. So they should do a moderate uh, activity. They can play, they can do some run, but not excessive and no physiotherapy. We never did that. And then uh, another question has to do with the osteotomy of making the osteotomy perpendicular to the long axis versus angling the osteotomy. And in angling the osteotomy, it seems that you would have more bone to bone contact and perhaps have quicker healing. And have you done this or thought about this? Yes, we always do that. I didn't cover that because 
uh, that presentation I just showed you was uh, only for the difference uh, using the pole two plate, and uh, uh, we always angle, but it should be an angle very little, five degree to seven degree no more, because if you angle too much, uh, the, the distance Q could be too uh, too close to the theotomy uh, on the transcortex, and so it could be a very weak fixation. But very important to be perfectly perfectly centered between the third and the fourth hole and to make an oblique cut just of five degree no more. Okay. This next question, it might involve you too, Steve. Um, what biomechanical advantage do you see by the Paul procedure compared to the Q? Well, if we look at the, what the Paul procedure is doing, the Paul procedure is is changing the force across the joint. So it moves the paw further lateral, which then brings the, the forces from the ground reaction forces through the joint shifted a bit more to the lateral side. So it's actually unloading the medial compartment where the Q device is just a, a spacer put into the joint and it may not be doing anything to change the force through the joint. It's just a partial change to the surface that the, the force is transferred across now rather than through the, the lack of cartilage. It's now putting it across that peak, uh, peak spacer. I mean, polyethylene spacer. I can, uh, Otto? Yes. Otto, I can, I can add uh, my consideration because I, I, I evaluated that possibility, but uh, with Paul, uh, our treatment is forever. While with a Q, you cannot say that it's forever because the polyethylene could be wear out and then you have to repeat the surgery. And we already saw, as been shown by us, by colleagues, cases where the polyethylene was completely gone and the metal was rubbing and creating a sulcus in, into the medial uh, condyle. And so uh, that is a concern. And I have a huge experience with total hip replacement and polyethylene. And I know that polyethylene will be destroyed sooner or later. While with Paul, that is a permanent procedure. One uh, question, again, this could be for both Aldo and Steve, is it seems that there's controversy in the experimental findings that are published by Krocek and others looking at the actual performance of the Paul in vitro, and your clinical findings are much different. Is there a way to explain these differences? This would sure. be a good one for Brian, I'm sure, but... Yeah, this would be perfect for Brian because his the testing that they did at Texas A&M showed a, a much different result than the published article from the from the other group. Um, the testing that they did at the other place, the paw was not allowed to move to a new position between the uh, different groups, and in the paw group. What we really want to see is that the paw is now allowed to find a new place further lateral than it would have found if it did not have the paw procedure performed, which then would allow the forces across the joint to be changed. Obviously, if you put a, if you put a, do the paw procedure and you keep the paw fixed in the same position, it looks like it would kind of do the wrong thing for the joint. And that's obviously not what's happening. The, there is a change in the forces across the joint because there are yeah, approximately 5,000 clinical procedures performed now. And as Aldo has demonstrated, there is, some, there is definitely some good that is coming out of doing the Paul procedure. I would add that, that um... It's a pity that Brian could not um, connect with us because he's doing a very interesting study of looking at the complete uh, four-limb mechanical angle, taking his race in uh, 
uh, a wake dog standing and uh, we are doing a similar study with the dog uh, sedated but uh, taking the full limb so from the human head uh, to the paw and to look at the uh, full uh, mechanical axis of the of the front limb and uh, he has been able to demonstrate and we saw also in our uh, clinical cases that you we, we really change the mechanical angle of the front limb and uh, again another consideration which is a general consideration comparing in vitro or ex vivo study and in vivo study it's a huge difference so whatever you find in ex vivo could be taken with a caution in the triangle of uh, uh, of um, evidence-based medicine they are the lowest level so uh, i think that looking at the clinical evaluation of dogs uh, after surgery with a, a complete evaluation objective as much as possible with a questionnaire with a horse plate with an x-ray evaluation you can really achieve a good understanding of what the procedure is providing. This is at least my point of view as a clinician. Okay. Um, and Aldo, this is just a question just for confirmation that the first look arthroscopy and the paw procedure yeah. were done simultaneously at the same setting in your in your cases. Oh, you mean the second the second side and the I, I, it, it says, uh, please confirm that the first look arthroscopy and the Paul are conducted in the same setting. I guess meaning that you did all uh, the first case, uh, the original Paul also had arthroscopy along with it. Oh, yes. So we always do arthroscopy. We, we don't because, you know, if you if you don't do arthroscopy, you do your poor procedure, you never know exactly how was the condition inside the joint. And then if you don't achieve a good outcome, you don't know the reason. So I want to be sure that I know exactly how was the condition inside the joint and we keep, uh, we, uh, we store all the records. Oh, here, Brian, it's coming. So we always store our data before and so we can compare with the condition and we can understand if the outcome is not as expected. All right, well, I hear that uh, Brian has joined us. Um, is that the case? Do we have Brian online? Yes, hi, Steve. Okay. Hi, Brian, good. I'm uh, very sorry for missing the, uh, the time. I have figured out what has uh, happened. We have daylight savings time in the US, and when this was scheduled, it was before the time changed and rolled back, and, and that didn't translate to the calendar. So. That's what has explained our, our time all went back here in the, in the U.S. on Sunday night, one hour. Yes, Sunday right. Night. Good, we'll oh. turn it over to you. I will summarize and, and, and try to be brief. Again, my, my deepest apologies there. So, you know, for me, how I got into uh, limb alignment and osteotomies was just clinical observations. And, you know, typically clinical observations lead to research questions and research projects. And so these are two great arthroscopy examples uh, of the spectrum of pathology we see with canine elbow dysplasia. These are both three-year-old Labrador retrievers uh, with very similar uh, presenting signs and yet arthroscopically, you know, on the right, we have chondromalacia and very early pathogenesis. On the left, the same three-year-old dog, you know, severe medial compartment disease. And you know, what's the explanation for the dramatic difference in the pathology between these cases? And, and of course, uh, in a 10 or 15 minute lecture, we're not going to review potential causes of, of elbow dysplasia, but I just you know, wanna suggest that perhaps limb alignment should be considered as a component of the disease initiation, progression, and also treatment. And so similarities, of course, exist between medial compartment disease of the canine elbow and medial compartment disease of the human knee. And in the humans, of course, this is termed medial knee, gonarthrosis. And tibial osteotomies are used to uh, address this problem in human beings. And that's done with this CORA method that I'm sure most of everyone on the call is, uh, is familiar with. 
And importantly, in human beings, uh, as shown over here on the right, we have uh, a classic image from Paley's uh, text looking at the limb alignment of the lower limb the, the, of human beings from the hip down to the tarsus. And we look at the displacement or the, the difference between the center of the knee joint and the mechanical axis of the lower limb. And that's drawn from the center of the hip down here to the metatarsal. And, and what that is referred to as the mat or the mechanical axis deviation. And to map this out in human beings, this is done in standing position. And of course, everyone probably knows that, that standing radiography is uncommon in, in canine orthopedics. And so we got interested in looking at uh, limb alignment in general and a potential role in elbow dysplasia. And this is just a summary of our thoracic limb research program because we've I've, I've joined late, I'm gonna run over this quickly, but if you're interested in the methods and what normal reference values are for standing, Labradors or dogs in recumbents, uh, you can uh, check out these, these previous publications. Uh, the first one was by Zach Goodrich in, in 2014. Uh, we, we do have an active prog project in, in looking at dogs that have medial coronoid disease and how their limb alignment uh, is different from normal dogs. That's in progress. You see the enrollment numbers there. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're really interested in looking at the effects of surgeries on limb alignment, um, at the SHO and, and Paul, and we've published on both of those uh, here at the bottom. And then ultimately, you know, what is, what's the, the long-term goal? That's to determine if we can use limb alignment to select cases or improve case selection, uh, to make uh, prognostic indicators about disease progression, or it's just a component, a, a, a wheel of the decision-making and outcome assessment uh, you know, process. And so whenever I'm asked to speak about this topic, I'm, I'm, um, I'm always asked, how do you do the standing radiography? And so this animation uh, shows that, that process. We put the dog um, up on the radiography table and, and we shoot cranial radiographs of the proximal and the distal uh, extremity. And so this is just a view from caudal to cranial with the x-ray tube removed. We gently move the dog's pelvis haunches uh, out of the way, and so we can then collimate and obtain a proximal and then a distal radiograph. Some dogs that are small enough, of course, their entire limb will fit on a 17-inch uh, detector here in the States, but most medium to large dogs, we have to shoot a proximal and then a distal image. And this is the part that's very challenging because if the dog moves or shifts, we have to start over. They have to stand in a straight pose, for the proximal, then we drop the detector down and shoot the distal. And then we simply just take those and we merge those together through a Photoshop process. And then that allows us to use the Cora method to map out the limb alignment. And so this is an example of a dog that's in standing position. We identify instead of the center of the femoral head in a human, the center of the humeral head. And we map that down to the distal epiphyses of metacarpals three and four. And so in this image, this magenta line represents the, the thoracic limbs mechanical axis from the foot all the way up to the shoulder. And then of course we can come and look at the displacement of things like the elbow and the carpus away from that mechanical axis. Now, uh, we realize that this is not a, a trivial thing to do. Some dogs don't allow standing limb radiography. They're difficult and, and hyper in the, in the hospital and difficult to image. Uh, very obese dogs, it's, it's difficult to image cranially and obtain a good uh, clear picture of the proximal humerus because of the, the fat that is in the thorax. And so we also have been doing recumbent radiography in tandem. And so this is a way with sedation or non-sedation, you can do a similar process of shooting a full limb radiograph and, and allowing us to evaluate limb alignment. And so, you know, how did we then get interested in what the effect of limb alignment was on Paul or vice versa, how Paul changes limb alignment. Uh, and that was uh, you know, through the very promising clinical results that have been presented by uh, probably Aldo in, this, in the portion of the talk that I missed, uh, Ingo File and, and many others uh, that have, uh, have, have been involved in the early stages of this procedure. So we wanted to determine the effect of Paul on limb alignment using a, a ex vivo limb press model. And we did both standing and recumbent positions. And we just hypothesized that the limb alignment values after Paul would be different than our, our pre-Paul values. And so I'll skip over the methods a little bit. This is all published. We basically have a limb press where we take uh, healthy cadaver legs and we instrument them in stand, normal standing position. So here are the, the standing shoulder and elbow angles. And we load them with 30% body weight. 
We use an index mark to ensure that each time we remove the limb and reinsert it into the fixture, that it's in the exact same position. And importantly, we don't fix the foot on the base plate here. We allow it to contact freely uh, and we use a grid to measure the position of the foot. And so that's the, the basic process. So what we did was take standing radiographs in the limb press, then take recumbent radiographs out of the limb press, and then we went and performed PAL 2 and 3 on each leg. And so we just randomized whether or not each limb would receive the PAL 3 or the PAL 2 first. We would do the radiography, then we would pull the plate and switch to the other plate. And so we would do standing and recumbent radiography for both 2 and 3 PAL plates for every limb. And these are just examples of proximal and distal images that are then montaged together to a full limb uh, montage so that we can do our, our CORA method. And so we blinded uh, one investigator to whether or not these were pre-surgery or PAL-2 or PAL-3 by the use of uh, a digital block there, as you can see over the, uh, over the proximal radius and ulna. Uh, and then we evaluated uh, 12 limb alignment values, a single investigator evaluated those. And then we did some descriptive statistics, mean and standard deviation and such, uh, and did mixed uh, regression modeling. Uh, Bo Norby has been my collaborator on this for a very long time on all of our projects. And so uh, he's the, the one that has done the statistics on these. And we looked at just the effective variables on limb alignment. And I will jump right to the good stuff and talk a little of the specifics about what the Paul does to limb alignment in this ex vivo setting. And the, the, the first angle I wanna to talk to you about is this angle here, which using the CORA method is termed the mechanical medio proximal radius ulna angle. And that's just the angle formed by the axis of the radius and ulna and the joint orientation line shown here in green of the radius and ulna. And so uh, with our pre-surgical specimens, these are standing. We can see our, our mean and standard deviation MMP RUA values here. And as we sequentially perform a PAL2 or a PAL3, that angle increases as we abduct the limb at the ulnar osteotomy. And importantly, the PAL2 and the PAL3 are different compared to the, the pretreatment. So it's an incremental increase in PAL2 and PAL3. And this one is a, is a, is a similar angle to what Ingo has described in his, in his proximal medial joint orientation angle in his dynamic loaded radiography that, that, has, uh, that, that he has published. This is the mechanical humeral radius and ulna angle. And so this is the angle formed by the intersection of the mechanical axis of the humerus, which is red here, and the mechanical axis of the radius and ulna, which is this, this light blue uh, or, or purple color. And this is the angle that we're referring to. And by convention, we had to, to determine whether uh, basically the polarity of these angles. So if the angles open up medial to the mechanical axis, they're positive. If angles open up lateral to the mechanical axis, they're negative. And so shown on this graph, zero is, is here. And these are negative values because the angle is simply opening lateral. And so while this is increasing, what this is demonstrating then is in response to Paul two and Paul three, the, the humerus and the radius and ulna are becoming more coaxial as these numbers go from you know, negative eight to negative six to negative five. Okay, so the MMPRUA change that we talked about on the previous slide drives this change here of the mechanical axes. I'm gonna skip over this one and we'll talk about the mechanical axis deviation. In order to calculate this, you do have to be able to have the proximal humerus and the distal epiphyses of the metacarpus in a single radiograph. Once you've done that, you identify the center of the uh, humerus joint, you know, the, the joint orientation line of the distal humerus, and you draw a 90 degree perpendicular to your mechanical axis of the limb. And then you represent that as a percentage displacement relative to the long axis of the leg. And that's what we call the, the EMAD or the elbow mechanical axis deviation. And this is pre-surgery. We see the EMAD values are just right around two. And as we do PAL2 and PAL3, we reduce the EMAD. So we're translating the center of the elbow joint towards the mechanical axis of the limb, or conversely, if you wanna think of it the opposite way, we're shifting the mechanical axis of the entire limb away from the medial compartment and over towards the lateral compartment. This demonstrates the, uh, the intersection of the joint orientation lines of the distal humerus, shown here in green, 
and the proximal radius and ulna shown in orange. And we just called that the elbow compression angle in, uh, in a previous study. And so as we perform PALS, these two lines become more parallel. And if they're perfectly parallel, then they never intersect and the angle is zero. So pre-surgery in a standing pose, that those two joint orientation lines intersect at a, at a mean of 1.4 degrees. And as we perform the PALS, those values begin to decrease because we're abducting the limb and translating the mechanical axis of the leg towards the lateral compartment. This one is very interesting, and this we wanted to look at just grossly, did the foot lateralize in response to the osteotomy? And so what we did is, is use that grid on the base plate of the, of the, of the uh, limb press and measure the distance from the foot to a, uh, an index reference point, and then we performed the different paws and looked at how those changed. And so this is in millimeters, displacement of the foot away from a constant, uh, a constant uh, plumb line essentially. And there is uh, some degree or some number of millimeters of lateralization of the foot in response to the Paul two and the Paul three. And so I think I'll, I'll stop the specific uh, responses to Paul there given our time limitations and just summarize and say that in our ex vivo setting, the Paul altered limb alignment values associated with the radius and ulna, the elbow, and the thoracic limb mechanical axis. And it did that specifically through the osteotomy of the ulna. The values up in the humerus, like the mechanical lateral distal humeral angle, we did not detect any differences in those, you know, which you would predict based on the location of the osteotomy. And so the three millimeter Paul led to greater changes in the two. And what's really interesting, and I think uh, uh, encouraging as different groups do this types of work, is that our MMP RUA results were very similar to those described by Ingo when he used the, the simulated standing radiographs as shown here, courtesy uh, of, of Ingo and, and Kion. So this work that he's done previously in a totally different continent was very consistent with what we found with our MMPA RUA results uh, in standing and recumbent positions here in this model. And so, you know, for us, implications, this methodology is established and it's consistent across the different studies we've done. This is great proof of concept for future clinical studies. And again, I would just suggest that we should consider limb alignment as a component of, of, of selection and outcome assessment. And what has this led to at Texas A&M? Well, we've initiated a study in Labrador retrievers with medial compartment disease, and that study's underway. Dr. Kate Barnes, who's one of our clinical track faculty, is the lead investigator on that. We're collaborating on that. But this is just an example, as you see, that the, the entire foot in our ex vivo limb press, and you see the displacement of the elbow away from the mechanical axis of the limb and the response of the paw. Shown down here distally by this carrot is the position of the medial aspect of the pes and how that displaces laterally after the paws perform. How has this affected my clinical decision making? Well, it, it led to the initiation of this clinical study. And in dogs with medial compartment disease, uh, we more specifically consider limb alignment as part of our decision making in conjunction with the dog's age, the dog's function, arthroscopic and CT findings, these types of, of things. And, and frankly, familiar, familiarity with the technique and this proof of concept uh, work has resulted in an increase in our Paul caseload in, in client-owned dogs. And so a, a long list of people that has contributed to, to this specific project and the limb alignment project. And I will, um, I will just say thanks to each of those and for the funding that we've had uh, previously. So that Great. concludes my talk and I'm, I'm happy to, to hang around and, and answer some questions and have a discussion if there are anybody still on that, that would like to talk about it. Well, most of the people are still on and um... I think Otto has pro has been monitoring the questions, and I think there are a couple of them that are specific to your part of the presentation. So, I'll, Otto, if you would uh, see what questions sure, there have, are for um, Brian. Yeah, no, I'm glad you could actually get on. It's good to see the presentation. Um, Brian, this is a, a question for you, and a few people have asked it, um, and it's dealing with what do you think the big difference is between your study and Dr. Krocek's study that showed that the Paul really was not uh, removing or unloading the medial compartment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we, we talk about uh, um, these types of studies regularly, so this is not a question that's come out of the blue. I mean, I think we were really interested in 
practical applications uh, that that surgeons and practitioners could use in a clinical setting to evaluate the effect of Paul on limb position. So, you know, uh, the Crocheck study focuses on contact pressures, uh, contact pressure mapping in the in the medial versus lateral compartment. Um, I don't believe there was any, you know, uh, contact pressure mapping proximally at the trochlear notch or at the anconeal process. I think these were all, you know, at the at the um, at the uh, medial and lateral compartment level. And so the big difference for us was looking at this from a, uh, you know, just a, a global limb alignment. What specifically is happening to the mechanical axis of the thoracic limb, much like uh, a uh, orthopedist would do in human beings with with medial knee gonarthrosis? So the clinical process is, hey, my I'm having pain in the, in this part of my knee. You have an MRI, maybe an arthroscopy. You have uh, localized and and ebernation, full thickness ebernation on your medial compartment. They perform standing radiography and look at your varus and and, and valgus angles as they make decisions on tibial osteotomies. And so, um, you know, I thought that we would look at this from a limb alignment perspective instead of trying to instrument, you know, do research dogs, experimentally owned or institutionally owned dogs with contact pressure maps, you know, at, at different times. It's not very practical. Uh, and this next question, um, it's actually for Aldo, and it is, have you performed any paw procedures in dogs that have had a shortened radial head or a subluxated radial head? Um, no, really. I don't think that those dogs uh, deserve this treatment. Uh, if you have a short radius, uh, so a, a elbow incongruity because of short radius, usually caused by premature closure of the proximal or both distal uh, growth plate, in those cases, we do a bioblick uh, on uh, osteotomy, ostectomy, really, because we need to shorten the una and to have the to achieve the contact of the radius on the on the lateral condyle. So I don't think that uh, Paul is a good procedure for those abnormalities that are not due to elbow dysplasia, because in elbow dysplasia. The incongruity you get, you have, uh, is just a small incongruity. Is uh, most of the time is one millimeter or even less, maximum two millimeter in big dogs. While in those uh, premature closure of the gross plate, you have quite a lot of incongruity, four, five, six millimeter. And so that is another problem. And then, Brian, this question is for you, is based on your studies, do you see that there is a advantage of using a three millimeter step in the Paul versus a two millimeter step? Well, I would say that in, in the ex vivo work that the three millimeter Paul definitely drives a, a, a greater change in the limb alignment values. You know, go and look at the changes on the um, the, the proximal radius and ulna angle, the elbow MAD, the EMAD. Um, and so, you know, from a from a how much does this change limb alignment standpoint? Yes, the Paul 3 definitely has a larger effect between the Paul 2. But remember, these are cadavers. Uh, these are free from disease. They don't have uh, ankylosis, severe osteophytosis. Uh, and so in, in my hands, uh, having done a fraction of Pauls compared to Aldo, um, if I've had uh, challenges when doing Paul three and a and a more chronic dog of getting you know the, the tissues to be compliant to you know be able to to move the proximal plate down to the ulna, um, and Aldo has shared with me in the past and and if I misspeak for you Aldo please correct me that that uh, perhaps clinically the dogs that receive a Paul three may take longer to uh, to come back to a sound state than the Paul two so I'm not sure that we can translate the ex vivo work to the clinical setting when we've got uh, chronicity, osteophytosis. But, you know, what I think it does is it gives us a starting point for saying, okay, these are the values that uh, we have before surgery. And at some point, a group of us is going to need to get together and say, we need to make some, some basic, um, you know, guesses on if we're going to use different levels of abduction you know, which values to look at and what are the thresholds for different, um, you know, different procedures. Of course, Ingo and in, in his work has suggested that the 80 versus 82 threshold with that proximal, you know, medial, uh, uh, you know, compartment angle as the break point. But I think that's maybe where uh, this is more useful. 
just a just a point on that, Brian. In your presentation, you call it you call it Paul two and Paul three. Not to confuse the people that saw Aldo's presentation where he's talking about Paul two. So Brian's presentation, the two and three, refer to the step, the two millimeter and three millimeter step in the plate. Where in Aldo's presentation, the Paul two is actually the change of the type of screws from the Alps 1 to Alps 2 system where we use the KLS screws. So the newest version of the plates are the Paul based on Alps 2, and those are available in two and three millimeter steps. So. And, and, I'll, and I'll make things even more confusing is that we did our cadaver work with Paul 1, the first generation of implants, uh, but did two and three millimeter steps. In our clinical trial, we're using the, the Paul 2, the updated uh, instrumentation from, from the plate size and the step size there's there's no difference between paul one and paul two other than the paul screw two. has changed other and the screws the screw are a little larger changed. diameter in in the paul two version and then there's uh, one last question um and that is has ct images been used for the preoperative planning of the paul um, we view we use CT most of the elbows here and then do arthroscopy. So yes, we do use them for pre-planning as well. And I don't know if Aldo or Brian, you wanted to comment on that as well. So uh, about uh, the step, uh, two millimeter or three millimeter step, um, uh, in our cases, one third of the cases is a three millimeter step and uh, two thirds are a two millimeter step. And the reason is because uh, most of our patients were older dogs. And in older dogs, you have a more synostosis, more difficult to do that uh, angulation. And uh, of course, as I already Brian mentioned, they are more painful in the post-op period. So for that reason, because we saw good results with the two millimeter, we even, uh, in those cases, the three millimeter could uh, provide a better correction. We prefer to go with the two millimeter. While in younger dogs, uh, like uh, dogs up to three years of age, the three millimeter will be much better tolerated. And about the planning, the question, the last question, as I already told, uh, I think that uh, arthroscopy is uh, mandatory in uh, as a planning. I mean, we do simultaneously. Of course, we tell the owner we do arthroscopy, and if we don't see the indication of doing pole, we just clean the joint and flush the joint, and we don't do the procedure. But if we see the indication, it means a good uh, lateral compartment with a preserved cartilage and um, confirmation on media compartment disease, we do immediately the pole. But interestingly, the few cases of infection we had, we, I, we saw that we are linked to the procedure done after arthroscopy with a lot of fluid coming out. So nowadays, when we do arthroscopy and we decide to go for pole, we rescrub the patient, we drape again, and we do the pole procedure uh, like a, a first procedure. Great. Um... Otto, that's it for questions. We close out the Q and A session now. Okay. I'd like to yep, like I to thank our speakers, you. Brian, Otto, Aldo. Thank you guys for being available for this. And of course, like to thank all of our attendees. Uh, most of you stayed on for the extra 15 minutes. Appreciate that. It shows that there's definitely some interest in Paul. We'd appreciate when you leave from the webinar, there'll be a short survey. If you would answer those questions, it will help us to make these even better. If you want to learn more about Paul, there is a Paul course planned with a dry lab in Zurich on the 12th of December. Hopefully the COVID situation allows for us to still be able to do that. Uh, things are being canceled quite frequently now. Steve, There's I'm a sure that the vaccine will be available. Oh, I will. All right. Well, very good. There's a newsletter. You can find that on our website, keon.ch slash newsletter. And if you're interested to find more about Paul and get involved with Keon in any way, you can always reach us through our website. And we thank you for 
joining us and keep checking our website to find out when we have further webinars on the schedule and maybe let us know what would be an interesting topic for a webinar that will interest you. Thank you and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.